I'm so privileged to be with you this morning, um, and I just want to I just want to express um, just information that you didn't need to know about me. Uh, I sometimes use Australian colloquialisms that you might not understand. It's why we have the Holy Spirit. <laughs> just a word of revelation. I'll say some stuff. I might say something like chock a block. That just means it's full, right? That's that's all it means. You get that, okay? So if don't put your hand up, be like, Pastor Ben, what did you mean by that? Like, we'll figure it out, we'll put a translator up. Secondly, uh, my humor, uh, most people don't get it, so if I say something and you think you should laugh, then laugh. <laughs> Just don't, if it's a serious moment, don't laugh then, that'll be weird. You guys ready? Yeah. I'm going to do the formalities. Hey, I am from Australia originally, uh, my dark skin comes from my dad, um, in Malaysia, that's where I was born, they call me Kopi Susu, which means coffee and cream. <laughs> and uh, so my mum's Australian-American, um, and I married a wonderful woman called Emma. She lead pastors with me in, in the lower mainland. Uh, can I say, I, I usually show a photo, I forgot this time, but I've stopped showing a photo because honestly, people think I'm lying. She's so beautiful. And they're like, no, you just, you photo shop someone in there. <laughs> and then you see my kids, my son, Levi, he's 10 years old. He looks like me. Like, he literally looks like a mini me, brown skin, dark features, handsome. <laughs> so handsome, he doesn't even know it yet. And then I have a, our middle daughter, her name's Alice, she's eight years old. She has my dark hair and dark eyes, but she has her mother's light skin which is so cool to see the genetic change, right? And then my youngest, my delight, her name is Eden. She just turned five on the 1st of July. Uh, she is ash blonde hair, blue eyes, but my forehead. <laughs> so that's my family. Um, we moved uh, to Vancouver, or North Vancouver, four years ago to plant Avant Life Church. It has been a crazy wild ride. Uh, one filled with lots of pain and joy and excitement and things coming to pass we never could have imagined or done in our own strength. A great story of God's faithfulness. Um, and we came with 12 incredible young adult leaders who helped us plant and pioneer what is now a thriving church on the North Shore in Squamish and in recently in Surrey, uh, which we're excited about. Um, and so that's me. Got that out of the way. Boom. Done. Honestly, I think this morning God hasn't come to, to really to, to show himself necessarily through my journey. I think there's some stories within the Bible, and we'll reflect on some of my experiences. I know he wants to bless you with. COVID right across our country of Canada has reset a lot of things. It's realigned a lot of things. But one of the things I don't like about it, and I know you guys are like, there's a lot of things. Uh, but, but like masks, I can deal with. I hate them, but I can deal with it, right? The, the passive aggression around the vaccine, I can deal with that. Like, thank you, like, whatever. Um, what I can't deal with is the fact that how much fear has been used to motivate people. Uh, that just, I just doesn't float with me, right? And so I'm just here to remind us as Christians that Paul writes in 2 Timothy that we haven't been given a spirit of fear, but of power of love and a sound mind. And so this morning, no matter where you've come from, you need to remember that power is resurrection power. See, where the world is falling apart, it's deconstructing itself in the hope to find some form of redemption or salvation, we know that's only through Jesus Christ and resurrection power. Where this world is being divided more than ever, we're called to love through the most unifying love the world has ever seen. And then finally, a sound mind. Let me talk about a sound mind. With everything that's going on, especially in the West, with, with just how, how plagued our minds are through social media, through expectations not being met, through almost opulence that is crippling. He says, hey, I've given you a sound mind. So this morning, as we go through his word, remember, it's power, love, sound mind. This is our inheritance. This is what emp empowers us, right? We good? Yeah. Uh, we have a saying, and um, I hope this message, uh, message blesses you. Uh, I, I titled it, A People of Promise. Right, Because you all heard we are people of power, but we're only a people of power because we understand the promise. And if you don't understand the promise, the power means nothing. And so this morning, I want to, I want to talk about we are a people of promise, and we're a promised generation. In, in my church, we have this saying, it's called create space. Just create space. It, it happened, it's one of those antidotal stories that I was playing basketball. I know you're like, you play basketball? I'm not great, but I try um, I'm better than some. I always make sure there's one person worse than me. 
That's just what you got to do. Just make someone worse than you, you know? You don't have to be the fastest person running away from, from a problem. Just don't be the slowest. <laughs> and we play basketball. We play two-on-two pickup. And um, honestly, on the North Shore, we say, like, it's, it sounds like pickup. We literally go to this rec center called Delbrook where the, the national women's team train. It's the bougiest thing. You pay $2 and you get in. I love Canada. I don't know how this works in Australia. You're going to be paying 50 bucks. But here's $2. We go and we play. Uh, and we're playing. And myself and a friend, we're just absolutely crushing the other team. Now, one of the guys on the team is very good. He's actually better than, than both of us. But he's partnered with the worst. And um, <laughs> who's actually our Squamish campus pastor, Matt. And Matt is vertically challenged. Hey, if you're vertically challenged, we love you. You're amazing, I'm not having to go at you, but in basketball, you're like low-hanging fruit for us. Uh, <laughs> unless you're Muggsy Malone and you can, just, you can just drop it from anywhere in the court. So um, everyone's like, who's that? I'm like, it's a 90s thing. Um, so we're playing basketball and, and we're just crushing them. And my mate, who's actually very good, his name's Andreas, he, he doesn't come to church. He's, just, he's one of those friends that just is everywhere and... Um, he starts saying something to Matt. He's like, Matt, can you just create space? Can you create space? And typical pastor, we, we start hearing God speak through the most irrelevant moments. Because <laughs> he knows sometime we have to preach, so we need content. Um, and so I'm standing there watching him. You know, he's giving him this prep talk. You've got to create space. Create, position yourself so I can pass you the ball. And then all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit started downloading in me. Ben, how many times do you tell people to create space in faith? Like, like we often live a reactive faith life. Tower falls over God. I have faith that you can resurrect all things. But when, when you read the, the New Testament in particularly, you realize that these, the disciples that went on to grow what was the early church had proactive faith. They were green like Christians, not red like Christians. By that, I mean they go until God said stop. They didn't stop until he said go. They created space for faith. And so this morning, I know this sounds really like, oh, that's nice. I hope it inspires you. I really do. But we're going to talk about how do you and how does the Bible and what has God said about creating space in our life, and what can we learn from really powerful stories? Because when we look at creating space, we see, you know, uh, Pastor Sunil just talked about this. The woman who was bleeding, she created space in her life. And what did that space look like? Ridicule. She had to be walk through the crowds who would scream she's unclean, that she didn't belong. She had to walk through that space. And in doing it, she created what? Faith. And when she reaches out and touches the robes of Jesus, the Bible says that power left his body without his command. Because you remember the story. He says, who touched me? And there's no one did. I'm like, who lies to Jesus? <laughs> but really, why he wanted to know is so that she could acknowledge herself, so he can acknowledge her. Because what she did was create space, reaching out, touching the robe, even though everyone around her didn't want her there. So maybe you're here this morning. I don't know what's afflicting you. Maybe it's a health crisis. And you need to reach out to Jesus and create some space this morning to allow him Honestly, he doesn't say a word. The power leaves his body. Why? Because the Bible says the faith of that woman. Or maybe you're just like Mary and Martha. You have a friend that needs resurrection right now, needs hope right now. They create space. They send for Jesus. They go, Jesus, come. They don't, they don't just allow Jesus to assume something. Oh, something's wrong with Lazarus. There's a communication space that they create. And we see Lazarus resurrected. Or maybe you're like the Roman centurion who sends a servant and says, hey, no, you don't need to come, Jesus. You just need to speak the word. Maybe like Peter, who actually asked Jesus if he can come to him. It wasn't Jesus who initiates that conversation. It's Peter who says, Jesus, if that's you, Lord, if that's you, tell me to come and I'm going to come. That's how you create space. Or maybe you're just like Jesus. And I think the world needs more people like Jesus who create space like he did at the well for the Samaritan woman. So what? She could have a revelation of her value. Like even he created space for faith to invade her life. And we know she goes on and creates a, a, a full revival in her town. So this morning, whatever afflicts you, whatever distracts you, whatever burdens you, it could be good news, it could be bad news. 
It could be the unknown. It could be the fear of the, the, the condition of this world. Whatever afflicts you, power, love, sound mind. Let's create some space this morning to see Jesus move like only he can move. So I've got a question for you right now. Who here wants to be blessed? I want to be blessed. I'm not kidding, man. I want to be blessed. I want God to favor me. I want him to appoint me. I want him to empower me, perfect me, protect me, provide for me. I want to be blessed. I hope that's, that's a desire of your heart too. But if I was to take a, a bit of a look at what I mean by blessing, what I start to realize is often as believers, blessing is actually more to do with perfection. We want to be perfect. Why? Think about it. You want the perfect job, perfect family, perfect marriage, perfect house, perfect kids, perfect finances, perfect image, perfect angle. You know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about living in a self-created bubble of perfection and passing it off as being blessed. That's not faith. Humans can only get a few things perfect at one time. And even then, we can't sustain that perfection. Like, you, can, you think about any sportsman who perfects their sports and climbs to the top of the world rankings. They, they, they can only be there for a certain amount of time. We don't have the power to sustain it. See, one of the greatest illusions you can ever invest in is the belief that life is meant to be perfect. It's not meant to be perfect. Jesus is perfect, 100%, but your life won't be perfect. What you achieve won't always be perfect, and that's okay. I say that not just to give you permission to be, uh, to be okay with how your life looks like right now, but to understand don't try to achieve the unattainable in your own strength. This morning, I think if we if we to really look at creating space and the importance of it as believers, we've got to revisit one of the original promises. Because I said the title of this message is, hey, I want to be a people of promise so that we can be a people of power. So I want to look at one of the original promises. And it takes us to have a, a, a sort of a perspective shift to really understand what I'm talking about this morning. When I moved to Vancouver, everything I thought would be easy was hard. Everything I thought was hard was easy. So what I mean by that, everything I thought I could do in my strength fell apart. Everything that I thought that God had to do in his strength was easy. And, and, and I classified God's things as hard and my things as easy and inverted. And I just remember, like, my visa fell through a few weeks before arriving. Like, and my, my lawyer here, who's wonderful, was like, Ben, you can't arrive. And I'm like, my stuff's ready on a ship. And she's like, you just can't come. It's, it's the worst decision. I'm like, Vivian, I'm coming. And we arrived, and she informs me, she's like, you've got great faith, but if you don't have a proper uh, status by, you know, July 19th, all your goods that are coming in by ship are going to be impounded. And then what? And then auctioned off. I'm like, what? Why does she, what was the government going to do with pictures of a brown kid? <laughs> like, we didn't bring anything of, like, real value, like, in, in material sense. We just brought family heirlooms and, like, pictures. She's like, it doesn't matter, they'll sell it. I'm like, that sounds like a crime. <laughs> we couldn't get our social security number. It means we couldn't get a house because no one's going to rent to you, right? You couldn't own, like, property. You couldn't own, like, it was hard to get anything. Can't get a car because you, you don't get bank accounts. It's like, it's hard stuff, right? And I remember just going to churches and we were visiting local churches, getting equated with different, you know, the church scene and what people are doing and meeting leaders and teams and all that. But every church we went to in that, that season of time was singing this song. You'd know it. It's in the waiting. Do you remember that song? It's in the waiting. Take courage. I'm like, shut up. It's like, it's like, a, it's like a worship leader. Wearing back then as the worship leader hat, skinny jeans that were torn, you know what I'm talking about? One or two, two long chains. I'm like, what's going on here? But anyway, they're, it's in the waiting. And I'm like, the only thing you wait for, bro, is your Starbucks coffee. And when you sing this song, you're thinking about having to wait five minutes. I'm like desperate. I'm full projecting, right? Everywhere I went. But I love my God because 
prior to landing in Vancouver, I said, God, you know, first two months, I just want to rest. I just want a little bit of peace. He's like, oh, okay, cool. The first two months, no rest, no peace, just anxiety and stress. And I love it the day that my visa came through. I kid you not, my came through, I got the email. <laughs> my lawyer calls me and she's like, Ben, um, I know your stuff arrives tomorrow, but look, best thing you can do, wait a few days before you cross the border um, because you could get a bad uh, you know, immigration officer and it could really stuff things up. Um, and I was like, oh, okay, Vivian, too late. <laughs> I'm at the border. And um, I just crossed. I'm like, I'm like, I don't care, Vivian. This, this is what it is. Uh, there's no more waiting. Crossed the border. It was great. Came back through. And I kid you not, 9 a.m. that next day, we signed our stuff to be delivered. Now, delivered where? To houses that he had provided that we shouldn't have had. Like, we are, we are given a house in West Vancouver. And if you know that part of town, it's like super bougie. I'm like, they shouldn't have given us that house. But anyway... Uh, we lived in this mansion for the first 10 months with a lot of the team, um, and even then it was still too big. But the guy who gave us that house honestly wasn't a Christian, wasn't a believer. He said, every time I had someone else come through the house, all I could think of was you. So six weeks later, after I'd asked for it, he came back to me. He's like, you can have the house. I said, that's cool. I need an extra person and $1,000 off. And he's like, okay. <laughs> and he, get, he gives it, right? Because it's in God's timing. We had all these things provided for us in a promise, because he said, I've called you, I've commissioned you, I've pointed you, I'm going to make a way for you. And the two, two months I could have properly rested in that, that promise, but I didn't. And I remember God just saying, hey, I gave you two months, you wasted it, it's on you. <laughs> like there was no like, God of the second chance, here's two more months. He's like, no, you wasted those two months, move on. It's fine, <laughs> I'll sustain you. And I was like heartbroken. Heartbroken with myself really, right? Just like, We see in Hebrews 11.1, 1, we know this scripture. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for and for evidence of things not seen. It's quoted so many times. So you can't read this scripture without knowing the context. Uh, prior to this scripture uh, in chapter 11, verse 10, we're talking about how, you know, we see the writer talk about the, the new covenant in Jesus Christ was superior to the old covenant of animal sacrifice. This is what he's saying. He's talking about the new covenant. He's reminding them, hey, we're not to shrink back, but we're to have faith. Let's not go back to what was a system that wasn't going to sustain us. Let's step forward into the new covenant of power, love, and a sound mind. See, with that definition, it now ties in to the commands that we see exampled later on in the coming chapters, where, where the writer begins to pull out believers and heroes of the faith and how they stepped out in faith. See, it's the former evidence and the future expectation that they're bringing together in this scripture verse. It's essential when we're interpreting these words. That when we look at it, it's the assurance and conviction of faith. It's not blind belief or gullibility or wishful thinking. It's based on the study of various characters mentioned in the chapters and scriptures before. And, it's, and it's, it's reliant on all the good that God has brought out in their life. That's why we know, we know it's faith is this substance things hoped for. Why do we know it's hoped for? Because he's done it before and he can do it again, right? And it's unseen. Why? Because it's into the future. It's the evidence of things that we can't see. It's happening right now around us. As the Holy Spirit ministers right now, it's unseen to you, but he's doing a work in your life. And so when we look at this now, faith is the substance. It's a thing. Substance. It's not this ethereal, like, you know, untangible, uncontrollable thing. It's a substance of things hoped for. I love that we serve a good God. I love that we serve a God that demands faith from us. Because in that faith, he includes us in the game. See, when when my friend was saying to my my campus pastor, Matt, create space, he was saying that so he could pass him the ball, so that he could include him, activate him, so he could be a part of the purpose and plan of that game. So when Jesus is saying to you, create space for me in your life, it's so that you're available so that he can pull you off the bench and put you into play so that you can have an effect on people's lives around you. Often we're like, we, we, we warm the bench and then we're like, oh, don't put me out there. 
Look, can I tell you, he's not getting you to, to hit the three-point buzzer winner. Jesus did that already. He's asking you to play a game of pickup so that the people around you can experience that resurrection power in your life. Game's been won. He played for keeps. He took it all. It's good. You don't have to stress. We don't all have to be a LeBron. I'm not a fan anyway, so if you are, we'll talk about it later. Faith is no more alive than when it's chasing down the promises of God. I'm going to repeat that. Someone needs to hear that this morning. Faith is no more alive than when it's chasing down the promises of God. The promises of God in your life. If you're having a faith crisis right now, it's because you need to go back and revisit the promise that God put on your life. If you're having a faith crisis right now, you need to begin to create space for the Holy Spirit to speak to you right now. There is an issue going on in the early church that Paul is commissioned to respond to. And the issue is, is that there's a bit of heresy entering into the message of Christ, which is, is, is in, in a simple sense is this. Uh, they were saying that you, it's not by faith anymore, it's by works, right? And so what they were doing, which makes sense, we've all been there, is that, that they're essentially in their faith going back to Egypt. They're going back to what was, Old Testament. And it's back to works. And so Paul comes in and his job is to address this issue. And he writes this in Romans 4.3. He says, Abraham believed God and it was accredited to him as righteousness. I, Abraham believed God. It didn't say Abraham did A, B, C, D, E, F, G with all these different caveats of things that he accomplished. And he did a lot in the you know, logistical sense. It's just Abraham believed God. How simple is that? How many of, this, of us this morning can say we believe God? Because if all of a sudden we, we take time to reflect on I believe God, then some of our insecurities, most of our fears, and if not all our blindness is removed. This is the promise I really want to focus in on because Paul says Abraham believed God. Believe God for what? Well, he's actually referencing Genesis 12, 1 to 3 because the Lord turns up and he calls Abram. He says this, verse uh, 1, chapter 12. The Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your people, your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your, great na your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless who blesses you, and I will, whoever curses you, I will curse. And this is the part I want you to remember. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Isn't that an interesting part of the promise? That last bit doesn't say all your, you know, your, your offspring, all your descendants. It doesn't say that. It says all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Hey, we need, to, we need to stop and think because this is important for us as believers. One, because we are living that promise right now. We're living that blessing right now. See, when, when the Lord says all peoples on earth, he's talking about in and through this promise, in and through your obedience and faith to it, will come the Messiah, the hope of the world. See, God outlines to Abraham this beautiful, and we see it in Genesis 15, this concept of a promised land. And this is what I want to talk about, because when we look at a promise, sometimes it's like, I'll get as a preacher, I'll come up here and say, it's promise, it's this, create space, whatever, and it's like, that's cool, what are you talking about? What's some tangibles? Well, let's talk about the tangibles in this promise, and how we can reflect on that, how it actually applies so much to us as believers. So when God says to Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation, in chapter 15, he goes on to say, I'm going to give you a promised land, and you will inherit it. Now, we've got a picture that I hope can work on the screens. Uh, and this picture is of what we call the fertile crescent. I know it's terrible. It looks like we just turned to the back of the Bible, right? <laughs> you guys remember that? That's the fun. That's how I got through like so many church services as a kid. This is what we consider the fertile crescent. And uh, it's important for us to understand this because this is considered the cradle of civilization. It's this region in the Middle East that curves like a quarter moon shape. You can sort of see it, use your imagination. 
And within it, we see the Persian Gulf. So it's from the Persian Gulf to the modern-day southern Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Israel, and northern Egypt. This region has long been considered vital and a vital contribution to the world culture. So many civilizations and cultures came out of this fertile crescent. The the uh, Mesopotamian empires, the Egyptian empires, the Levant came from here, which is Sumerians, Babylonians, Assyrians, Egyptians, Phoenicians, all whom are very, very, very valuable to the development of human civilization. They all, honestly, this is the cradle. And then it, it makes you question something, right? Doesn't this... Doesn't this make more sense now? Because all of a sudden, if I look at this and go, well, you know, when we see, when we see where the Middle East is and, and we see where Israel is, it's, it's the narrowest portion of the Fertile Crescent and it's the only portion that connects Europe, Africa, and Asia together. It's actually the only part of the world that has three great continents connected in one area. And you look at it and you go... That's where God told Abraham he was going to inherit. You're going to inherit the geographical center of civilization. We're like, wow, that's awesome. That's amazing. Because that gives you the ability to what? Influence. Does it not? You can influence to so many cultures from the center of this cradle of civilization. Now all of a sudden the promise makes a little bit more sense. I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to place you into the promised land. That place is going to be a place of influence, a place of abundance. It is very fertile. That whole area is is fertile. It's, It's so important that every empire wants it. And any empire that wants to be great needs to occupy it. Wait a minute. How, what? Psst, okay. Think about that now. You're Abraham. God's calling you to these places. Something has to begin to shift and click because things aren't what they look like anymore. We hear milk and honey, we get excited. We're like, what was wrong with the Israelites? Why can't they just go conquer the promised land and enjoy it? Well, now that we sort of know what's going on, now we know that every major empire in that area occupied that land. Now that we know that it changes occupation and, and authority about a thousand times over three millennia, now that we know that every person who wants influence in that known world needs that space, now we know that if you're going to march your armies anywhere, that's the only place you can do it so that they can get water and food because if you did it east of the mountains, they would die God says, you're going to occupy that. See, when we fast forward to the image of the Israelites in Egypt, leaving Egypt, and God saying to them, you're going to inherit the promised land, they just spent 400 years in Egypt. Egypt constantly fought campaigns in the Middle East, up north against the Assyrians and the Syrians and the Babylonians. The, the, the Israelites are not just like numpties that don't know anything. They're an intelligent, smart, civilized culture. They knew the geopolitical climate of the land that God was giving them. They knew that land was completely occupied. They knew that it was constantly changing hands. They knew that it was fortified cities. They knew that people wanted it. They knew that Egypt, even though where they would leave, was constantly fighting wars to try to regain it. The promised land wasn't just... An inconvenient truth to the Israelites, it was an impossible reality for a nation of slavery for 400 years to be told you are going to occupy and control what many, many empires far greater, larger, more powerful than you have never accomplished to do. So this is my thoughts. We see in Numbers 13, 17 to 20, we see this picture uh, and we all know this story, and if you don't, it's a powerful story. It's, it's the picture of the Israelites camped just before the promised land. And Moses sends out these spies. I'm going to read it to you. It says, Moses sent them to explore Canaan. He says, go up through the Negevand into the hill country. See that the land is like, and whether the people who live there are strong or weak, few or many. What kind of land do they live in? Is it good or bad? What kind of towns do they live in? Are they unwalled or fortified? How is the soil? Is it fertile or poor? Are there there trees in it or not? Which is a good question. 
Do your best to bring back some of the fruit of the land. It was seasoned for the first ripe grapes. So Moses commissions these four spies, sends them out. And we see in Numbers 13, it says, When they reached the valley of Eshkol, they cut off a branch bearing a single cluster of grapes, and two of them carried it on a pole between them. Hey, last time you went to like a Savon or a Safeway, did you need a buddy to carry the grapes out? They needed a buddy system to bring these grapes back. We see in Numbers 13, right? So they, they all come back. They, they're carrying the grapes, one bunch of grapes on a pole, two of them. They bring it back. And, and now there's a congress of people together, and they give a report. And we see in Numbers 13, 28, the report says, The people who live there are powerful. The cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there, giants. And... When we read this, we're like, oh, man, but you brought back big grapes. (laughs) Can I tell you, your promise, where God's called you, is fertile soil. It's a place of influence. That's why he's called you there. Why? Because you carry the resurrection power, the message of Jesus Christ, hope, light to the world. That's what you carry. He's going, your promise will always be an influence. But can I tell you, where there's fertile soil, where there's big grapes, What eats big fruit? Big people. (laughs) If you have to carry the grapes out of your calling, chances are there's giants that want it. That's the truth. They even say that there's giants. They're like, hey, fruit's good, but guess who eats them? (laughs) Caleb silences the people before Moses in Numbers 13, 30 to 30. He said, we should go up and take possession of the land, for we certainly can do it. He is reflecting on the promise that God's given, not what was visible to them. Do you get what I'm saying? Everything about the promise of your, on your life that God has given you, he's commissioned you into, is impossible for you to achieve outside of him. That's just the reality. And everything you can achieve in, you know, without him, then, then it's, it's all just superficial. Because he's called you into a place of prominence. Now, it might not look like, you know, you're going to be the Prime Minister of Canada. Maybe you are. Please do a good job. (laughs) But we've got to look at the promise over what we can see as the persecution. That's what we've got to set our eyes on. We fix our eyes onto Jesus. We fix our eyes on the great promise fulfiller. The one that empowers us to achieve what is impossible in our life. Some of the most simple things in our life that we need to achieve are impossible in our own strength. Some of the hardest things we can do very easily. Big fruit equals big giants. Don't let what you see cause you to forget what God said. Never let what you see ahead of you Cause you to forget what God has said. What he has said to you will empower you for life. What he's promised you will cause your faith to come alive. You've got to create space for those words and promises in your life. My grandmother had scripture words, uh, verses on her wall. They looked ugly. They weren't cool. They weren't done with interior. You can do them with interior. She could have done better. She didn't care. Those words were promises. They were paramount in her life. She prayed with those promises forcing a shadow on her. Church, after the pandemic, what we need right now more than ever is Christians creating space for faith so that they can inherit the promises of God in their life. You can be afraid. That's okay. You just can't stay in fear. Why? Because we serve a King of kings and Lord of lords that has overcome fear. I'm not saying I never feel fear. I just don't allow it to possess me. I don't allow it to enslave me and parade me around like a captive. I've been set free. I'm no longer a slave, but there's still a battle ahead of me. There's still walls to come down, seas to part, mountains to move, mindsets to be shifted. You are integral to the call of God on this city of Calgary. Every person who does not walk in the promise that knows Jesus means the church is less effective. You have opportunities each and every day to stand up, 
and go, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have the I know what God said attitude or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with what I see attitude. It's my last point. We've got to learn to embrace the space. You like that? It rhymed. I liked it. I worked real long on that one. See, the ability to influence is at the heart of the promised land. That's what God's saying to him. I'm going to let you, prom- I'm going to let you, you know, influence people. It doesn't speak of military might. His promise spoke of greatness, not of military strength, but of greatness. Israel's greatness was never to be found in the military, but in its millennia-old incubation of the coming Messiah. It was bringing Jesus. That's, what, that's its greatness. Our greatness is that we bring Jesus. It was not that you would be the most powerful person in the room in a human context, but you would be the most powerful person in the room because you love right through Jesus, because you influence right through Jesus, because you bring the spirit that can resurrect. We see that all authority that was given to Israel wasn't about military. It was about resurrection. Our authority isn't found in destruction. It's found in resurrection. We see John 2, 18, 20. I'm shooting through this just so we get all the content. We see the Jews respond to Jesus. What sign can you show us to prove your authority to to do all this? And Jesus answers them. He says, destroy this temple. (laughs) Sounds like Goethe. Destroy this temple, I will. Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it in three days. Do you know what I love about this? The Jewish leaders weren't concerned in the destruction time. They were concerned with the resurrection time. We can destroy things overnight. Humanity's good at that. What we can't do is resurrect from dead to life. Only Jesus can do that. Only Jesus can rebuild overnight. And this is my point. We've got to embrace the space of resurrection in our life. We've got to embrace the space of the promises of God in our life. We've got to stop thinking about what's happening for us personally and subjectively and selfishly and realize that God didn't come to establish a nation on this side of eternity, but to establish a family on that side of eternity. See, heaven is a reality right now. He said yes to Jesus. It's not an insurance plan for the afterlife. It's so that you were brought into this great conversation, this great battle, this great defense of truth, this cosmic war that's going on. You have a place and a purpose and a promise in that. You are being commissioned to rise up, mighty man, mighty woman of valor. There's walls in this city that need to come down. And God's looking for people to walk around them, to pray. There's seas in this city that need to be parted and God's looking for individuals who'll thrust their staff into the depths and see God's miracle come. There's mountains that need to be moved and God's hoping that someone would have the voice, the courage and the actions of faith to speak it into the ocean. Church, would you stand with me this morning? I really do believe, I don't know what your story is, and if you're like me, you can sit and get really like bored in services like this sometimes, because you just, whatever. Hey, but if I have one job this morning, it's to speak to you right now and say, hey, don't waste this moment, don't waste this opportunity. Hey, didn't COVID just prove to us that we're better together? that we're meant to be a family, that corporate worship has a powerful place, that God moves in services like this. God moves when His people glorifies Him and begin to unify their faith and their content and their focus all to what He is saying, not what they... uh, Your desires are important, but His promises are powerful. And so this morning, I want to leave you with this scripture verse. It says, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. There's nothing comfortable about this. Zero comfortability about what Jesus said here. But what he's saying is, is that if you, if you believer, son, daughter, if you would pursue the promises that I have placed on your life in faith, if you create that space, would you embrace it? Would you step out in it? Would you not shrink away from it? Would you be less concerned what people think about you in social media and more concerned about what they see in you when you walk into the room? Do they see Jesus? Do they feel the power of God? 
Social media is just a modern day towel of Babel just to prove that somehow we can have control in our own life. This morning, right now as we go into worship, God has been talking to people. He's been, he's been ministering. And then after, after a song, after we sing for a bit, we're going to pray that God would stir faith of men and women. Why? Because we are a nation. We are a people of power. We are people of love and of a sound mind. And He wants to resurrect some dreams tonight, or this morning, sorry. He wants to resurrect some promises that you've forgotten about. He wants to breathe flesh onto dry bones. He wants to begin to say, hey, I know that you might have had a promise that you've forgotten, but here it is. Step forth. Your life is an occasion. Rise to it, man. Rise to it, woman. Rise to it, child. Rise to it, son, daughter, prince, princess. We are co-heirs in this promise. Church, are you ready? Oh, you can do better than that. Come on. We serve a good God. Let's begin to lift our voice. God, we want your promises to reign in our life this morning. We want to give you all our attention, Lord. Come on, church. We see broken bodies healed. Don't you tell me. Church, this morning I want to pray for two types of people and just with every head bowed, just for privacy really. Maybe this morning you've come in and you're, you're just trying to recover from what's been a long season for whatever reason. Or maybe you've come in and you're looking for healing in, in your health or provision of finances or answers to questions that you've been carrying. Maybe they've been burdening you. And you know you need to step out and create that space in your faith life. You know you need to create those moments for God to pass you the ball where you've got to actually take that faith step, even though it's uncomfortable. Just in this moment, I just want to pray for those who go, hey, that's me. I want greater faith. I want to create that space. I want to find that rhythm in my life where I'm a go believer, not a red light believer. So if that's you without anyone looking around, I just wanna pray with you this morning. Could you just raise your hands? I just wanna ask the Holy Spirit to fill you afresh and to anoint you into this season. No one's looking. The act of raising your hand is just like reaching out and touching the robe. It's just a physical sign of this is me, God. I surrender. Lord, this morning, I thank you for every hand raised. Father, for every heart fixed and focused on you, Lord God. Lord, I ask, Holy Spirit, would you flood each and every person's life right now, Lord? Would you overflow? Lord God, would they find that rhythm of creating space? Would they see your promises more clearly than ever before? Would they chase them down and chase after them with all their energy, with every ounce of fiber and being in their body, Lord God? Would they chase it down for your glory? 
Holy Spirit, I pray as they go home, as they find moments to rest, that the conversation wouldn't end here, but that this would be the start of a powerful, beautiful dialogue between you and them about the season to come. Lord God, that you're commissioning them to make a difference in this city, in their workplaces, in their families, in their neighborhoods, in the community, Lord God. Lord, that every word they speak, every conversation they have would be empowered to bring you glory and to change lives. Father, I thank you for these faithful men and women willing to give their life for your cause. I pray a blessing upon them. Just an anointing, Lord God. Just in this atmosphere of worship as the eyes are still closed, we wouldn't wanna leave this morning without giving everyone the opportunity to step into a relationship with Jesus, to invite Him into your life. And you might be here this morning and go, what does that mean? The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth and you believe with your heart, and your mind that Jesus Christ is Lord, that you'd be saved. And what the, what the scriptures are actually illuminating here is that if you would begin to align yourself with Jesus and ask Him to come into your heart and begin to empower you, that not only would you have salvation, you'd have redemption, you'd have power, authority, vision restored. Not the earthly concepts, but the ones that bring real peace, the ones that are sustained by His Spirit. Maybe you've said yes to Jesus before. Maybe you've had a relationship with Him before. And for whatever reason, it's not in the healthiest place. Well, in this same moment, can I encourage you just to say, yeah, Lord, I wanna, I wanna be back in a healthy relationship with You. So if that's you right now, either for the first time saying, yeah, I wanna ask Jesus into my life, or maybe you're saying, hey, I wanna restore it back into health simply by acknowledging Him again as my Lord and Savior. Would you do something very simple with every eyes shut and head bowed? Would you have the courage just to raise your hands just so that I can see and pray with you? Is there anyone here this morning? I see that hand. Is there anyone else? I see that hand, powerful, never the same again. Is there anybody else? This is your moment. It's between you and God, changed forever. You get to step out of darkness into light. And I know there's a wonderful team here at, at Experience that wants to walk this journey with you so you're not alone. Is there anyone else this morning? saying, yeah, Pastor Ben, that's me. Church, would you repeat after me? And as we do this, would you repeat it with passion and excitement? The Bible says that even if one comes home, that all of heaven erupts and celebrates. And so right now, as we pray, and as you repeat after me, and maybe you didn't raise your hand, but it was the cry of your heart to say yes to Jesus. Well, you can pray this prayer too, and we're gonna join in with you. So church, as we repeat this, can we do this as a, not as a golf clap, but as a kingdom-minded family, celebrating with heaven that brothers and sisters in the house this morning just stepped into a relationship with Jesus. So would you pray after me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for His life, His sacrifice, and His resurrection. This morning, I ask you to forgive me of my sin and shame. And I invite you, Jesus, into my heart. From this moment forth, I declare that I am a son or a daughter of the Most High, that I've been called by name into the service of your family and I pray this right now in the powerful name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. amen. Let's give God some glory.